few minutes we'll be reviewing several procedures on videotape that have been put together for the purpose of continual education. Many times uh, I'm called upon as a consultant from veterinarians, farriers, insurance companies, owners and trainers to help them with equine foot problems. Finding it very difficult to perceive and transpose information on the phone, I have developed a consultation service that allows me to re review your case by video using radiography, hopefully teleradiology in the near future, we use the fax machine so we can hopefully review your case and come up with a constructive plan, treatment plan that will help you in your endeavors to deal with career and life-threatening problems. This tape has is, is been designed to show explicit detail of many of the procedures that have been some of my original ideas, development and improvement of other people's ideas, concepts of friends, colleagues, and so forth. To patch the foot, we must remember one cardinal rule. We cannot cover up an infected area. How do we identify an affected area? Basically, soreness over the coronary band, discoloration of the coronary band, and odor when the crack is cleaned up will give you a clue that we're now dealing with an infectious organism, even though there may not be any exudate or pus present. It's very important that this area is dried up and the infection is well under control before the patch is placed on the foot. Many times we do not have five to ten days to, to accomplish this. If you have a horse that is determined to go into performance class, which is racing, rate, slow performance classes of any nature, he has to go and the crack is infected and stability would get him through the next day's performance and follow the same procedure I'm going to give you. Put it on as late as possible prior to that performance and pull it off immediately following the performance. This will get you by many, many times. Remember, if the horse wins, the race, the class, or whatever, compete successfully. Don't think that that horse can go home with that patch on if you've covered up an infectious organism. You must remove the patch immediately. Otherwise, five to ten days from the time you put it on, you'll be looking at a very lame horse, which you've sealed bacteria within the foot, and you're looking at a situation that may render this horse absolutely worthless to that owner. Let's assume now that the horse has a routine crack that is not infected, it has a little hemorrhage, what do we do? I like to have the foot soaked, preferably one to two days, in hot Epsom salts, cleaning the foot up very thoroughly prior to putting the foot in the water. Take a handful of bran once the soaking is completed, put it in the concentrated Epsom salts water, soaking up the water, place it over the quarter, bandage the foot, in a normal fashion. This allows continual Epsom salts exposure to that foot. If your water is concentrated enough, you will find that the foot the next day will be very white and chalky because the Epsom salts will, re will be remaining on the foot and the water will be gone from the brand. You can do this two to three days in a row, even if you feel the foot may be infected with a little systemic antibiotic and you will protect the foot and heal the foot in such a fashion that it allows you a little better chance, lower risk procedure of patching the foot. Do not, once again, do not poultice the foot. Do not put ichthymol on the foot. Do not put any greasy ointment of any fashion on the foot if you plan on patching it. The foot that has been poulticed prior to patching usually fails due to the loss of adhesive nature between the patch and the foot. Poultice ruins the, the effect or destroys your advantage 
of applying an adhesive patch to the horn because the horn tubules will be swollen with water. The water content of the bulb of the heel has, is excessive. The entire foot is very flexible. Once the patch is applied, you're actually gluing to a water barrier. It doesn't work. I want the foot nice and hard and very dry. If a horse has been put up in a greasy ointment such as reducing venous turpentine, ichthymol, I don't want to patch that foot for a minimum five to six days after that's removed. I want it scrubbed off daily, clean with acetone, because those greasy ointments will penetrate into the horn and will be days before that penetration can be removed. The reason I prefer not to do them because many times you can travel several miles to patch a foot. If you get there and it is not of optimum patching capacities, the success of your patch then will be destroyed in many times only because the foot was not ready to be patched. Be very selective about placing patches on feet. Dry the foot out, harden the foot up with iodine, alcohol, anything that will dehydrate the horn. Do not burn the coronary band with strong iodine. This will cause an irritation. It will actually cause the horse to be tender. It will swell the coronary band and be very deceptive many times. The procedure itself is very simple. This is a basic approach with many variations that can occur between individuals, cases, and also feet. Using a Dremel, a variable speed Dremel, and a rock burr, you open the crack on either side. Approximately a quarter inch is all you need for the maximum width of your area that you're going to try to stabilize with stitching. Remember now that most cracks do not run straight through the wall, but they slope from outside to inside, front to back. So in other words, the front of the crack is always usually in front of the bottom of the crack. So wait, work your way through the crack very slowly with your Dremel burr, and as it disappears underneath the wall, then work that hole toward the bottom of the crack. You do not want to bring hemorrhage if necessary. Most of these cracks will be full thickness at the top and very painful for palpation. I prefer to only sedate the animal. Do not work on these cracks if they're blocked because you lose your ability to judge sensitivity. You will also lose your ability to know how tight to, to tighten the stitch. And you can also burn them with, a, with your drill bit and never know it. So I prefer not to block a foot to patch it. Once you open this up, and you slowly work along the bottom, trying to get to the bottom of the crack without bringing any hemorrhage whatsoever. If there is a foul odor, there's pus, the tissue is black and wet and you can't get rid of it, then you know you cannot patch this foot today. You may be three or four days drying it up. You may be three weeks. Do not be pressured in patching a foot that looks like what I just described. <clears throat> if it suits you, though, and you bring a little blood, no problem. Use silver nitrate, touch the area of hemorrhage, it'll immediately stop the hemorrhage, you can go right on. You hear people say, don't patch a wet foot. That means an infected foot. To bring a little blood, fresh hemorrhage, on a foot that's not infected is no problem. You can patch that foot provided you control the hemorrhage 100%. Once the crack is opened up, you dovetail underneath very slightly, as deeply as possible, using a 3 64th drill bit. You drill two holes on either side as far back as possible, opening up as deep into the crack as possible, in line with each other. Simply drill one hole, Pass a wire into that hole, go to the other side, using the wire as a guide, you aim for it. It's very important that these holes emerge in the same plane. Otherwise, you may be all day stitching this thing up. I use .035 stainless steel wire to stabilize the crack. This wire is bent 
double, folded double. I make a, a needle out of the, the closed end. Use a safety wire twister tool, which you can find from any aircraft mechanics guidebook. This tool costs anywhere from $50 to $100, depending on where you buy it. It's not an absolute necessity. You can twist this wire in a Dremel or in a, in a slow variable speed drill as well, which I did for years before I found one of these tools. Twist the wire so you have approximately six to eight twists per inch. If you over twist, you weaken the wire. If you under twist, you don't get maximum strength. I use this twisted wire then to make an inverted mattress suture going in one hole through the bottom, out the other one, emerging through the wall, putting a little button on. This is a brass button or a copper button which merely takes the stress off the wall, back through the wall, underneath, back out the other side. Before tying it, you need to loosen the wire so you have two loops inside the crack. Then you tie the wire on the outside, snip it off, lay the end down. Using a screwdriver, which you have fixed yourself, you just heat it, pull it out, put a slight little curve in it. You twist these two pieces of wire together as if you were tightening a brace on a corner fence post. Watch closely what's happening to the horn wall as you tighten this wire. If you over tighten, you can pinch the foot. You can break the wire. If you do not get it snug enough, you do not get support. If your cruciate pattern is put in properly, not only do you stabilize the wall from pulling apart, from going together, but you also stop the shearing action. Now, quarter cracks do not respond to the stresses of the foot like a toe crack. They do not close under load at the top, but they do at the bottom. Consequently, the shearing action that is formed as the bulb moves up and down in independent fashion is what really causes the pain and further destruction to quarter cracks. Actually, that's the reason they occurred. They don't occur for the basic same reason that do toe cracks. Sometimes I'll put a double lace. If I have a long foot, a long horn tubule, and a long crack, I will put two sets of this mattress sutures. On a foot that I may have six inches of crack, such as some of the saddle horses I do, I may put three or four series. Once this is done, I use the same drill bit. I go to either side of the, of the, uh, the, pa of the crack. I drill diagonal starter holes only at about 35 to 40 degrees from the surface of the foot. I insert screw eyes, which are number two, 16 screw eyes, into these holes, turning very slowly and threading them into the horn wall. Now you can put these very close to the corner of your band, as long as you laying it under the wall. You're not going into sensitive structures. When you have tightened it down as snug as possible, you want to make certain that the open side of this screw eye faces outward. It will become very important later on in procedure. Place about four to five of these down either side, trying not to stay in the same linear plane. You take the single strand of stainless steel wire, once you've accomplished this, and you weave it back and forth, back and forth, top to bottom. Several different patterns can be put in, but you end up at the top, tied off, such as this. Once you've tied it off, then you take the same screwdriver with your small crooked little point on it, and you make about four or five twists tying those bands together. Now you need to watch closely your screw eyes as you do this because you can pull them right out of the foot if you over tighten. Now you have a formed another cruciate pattern which stops further shearing. The patch is put on merely to stabilize the wire. That's the only use of the patch at this point. Any material can be used that's fast setting has great adhesive ability, and is easy to work with. I prefer acrylic. 
I use a fast-setting acrylic. It is a combination of, of uh, two very popular acrylic products. It's kind of a homebrew setup that I use. I will alter the consistency of it by adding or more liquid, less liquid. The type of powder can be altered. The color can be altered. There's a product on the market called Supra, which is made in Holland, which is proven to be a very valuable patch material. Pegasus material is very helpful. All the dental acrylics are very helpful that are fast setting. Technovite has been a very good product. And you'll find that all available materials today are successful in the hands of most individuals who design their work to make the product successful. Some have advantages over the others. The scope of this tape is not to such that we can discuss the advantages and disadvantages of all because it takes years of experience to, to be able to identify with them. This is a basic approach to patching the foot. Trimming the foot is as important as the patch. It's been my experience that all cracks must be lowered, the foot must be lowered toward the crack, past the realms of balance in order to be successful. Which means if you have a quarter on the medial heel, the entire plane of that foot should tip toward the area of the foot where the crack emerges on the foot. Not to the heel, not to the quarter to toe, but to the area where the quarter emerges the crack emerges at the ground surface of the foot. I realize that theory and a lot of people who have not patched feet before or have minimum experience in patching feet feel that this thought is absolutely the opposite of what it should be. Theory tells us if you want to remove the pressure on one side of the foot, you tip the foot the opposite way. Sounds great. Didn't work that way. You tip a foot away from a crack and you jam that heel. Consequently, your patch will fail almost invariably, particularly with horses that work at high rates of speed. If it's on the outside, you tip toward the outside. If it's on the inside, you tip to the inside. The entire plane of that foot is tipped to the side that the crack is involved. This is past balance. Remembering now that that quarter will grow quicker then will the opposite quarter by lowering it. Patches that fail usually fail toward the end of a reset. At this time, the foot will be grown back into balance and the medial heel may be longer in length than is the outside heel. Consequently, you will have many cracks to crack above the patch if this is allowed to happen. When you're called to reset a foot that's got a patch on it, that it's been on for five to six weeks. Be careful with that patch. Do not disturb it. Look at the foot if it's out of balance. If the inside quarter is longer, remember it has grown that way the last six weeks. Most likely it was not left that way at the time it was shod. So be very careful not to be critical of the fellow who put the shoe on because these quarters that I'm speaking of will always invariably outgrow the other quarter making an entirely different appearance than it was originally. The shoeing is also very important. I use the Z-bar shoe, which relieves the quarter completely. I use an egg bar shoe. I use a straight bar shoe occasionally. And occasionally I use the egg bar heart bar. When selecting the appropriate shoe for the horse that has a quarter crack, we need to keep a few things in mind. <clears throat> the weight of the shoe, performance of the horse, his ability to wear a bar shoe, I prefer all my horses to wear bar shoes, particularly if the crack is close to the corner bend. If the crack is far enough back that I can draw a line down the crack, touch the ground surface, and go a half inch in front of this point, and I can jump that off or otherwise put a Z-bar on that allows this much of the foot to float and still be well behind the last nail hole, then I prefer a Z-bar shoe, aluminum Z-bar shoe. Design and weld it together using the Coral 8-inch rod as described in my tape welding 
the egg bar or welding the aluminum shoe. If a horse has a real underslung heel and that crack lies almost horizontal, horizontal to the ground due to the fact of being underrun, you draw a line down the foot to where it hits the ground surface, go half inch in front, you'll see that it may be as far up as the second nail hole. Obviously, we cannot remove the shoe in this much of the foot in order to float that quarter to take the pressure away from that heel. Then you would go to an egg bar shoe, allowing the egg bar to touch the entire ground surface of that foot. It is very important to remember that you cannot cut the heel away from the affected quarter on a foot that the crack extends so far up on the foot that you lose a lot of the support to the foot. I see this happen an awful lot as preventive nature and you can actually cause a quarter crack by doing so. Steel shoes, same thing. Remember a Z bar is far better than an angle three-quarter bar that cuts across from, say, the last nail on one side to the heel of the other. This particular type of shoe would wreck the ankles because that bar acts as a rudder and you get a lot of torquing action to the foot due to the drag of that bar. Remember to tip the foot to the affected side. Do not put your nails close to the patch. Stay away from the patch if possible. If you have a patch that extends to the second nail hole, put your nails in the toe of that shoe. Stay away from the patch. If you'll follow my simple instructions of basic fundamentals of patching a quarter crack, you can adapt to many, many different materials, types of stitches, types of lacing, shoes, combinations, treatment thereafter, and hopefully it'll be some help to you. <music>